SpaceX has been making some excellent progress on the construction of their shiny new crew access tower at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station's Slick 40. That's not here, that's in Florida. Also, NASA rolled out the mobile launcher for SLS, and Blue Origin's new Glenn begins to feel the pressure. That's, that's a pun for later, you'll see. Hi, I'm Jack Beyer with NSF, and we'll go over all that and more in this Cape Flyover, sponsored by Brilliant. It's not going to be just me in this video though, we're also going to talk to Adrian, Sawyer, and Max to go over all of the content that we've captured. Let's start off with Max, who actually flew over the Cape and captured a lot of the video you're about to see. Hey Max, what's up with SpaceX's Roberts Road facility? Jack? Come on back to Florida, man. We miss you. This time around, we saw a significant amount of progress at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility with regards to the new crew access tower that's being assembled for Slick 40. For those late to the party, SpaceX is building a crew access tower for Space Launch Complex 40, which is used to fly Falcon 9 from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. This is a redundancy measure to ensure that if something were to go wrong with LC-39A, <coughs> Starship, the capability of flying crew to the International Space Station is not compromised. We had only seen two tower segments last time out, and thanks to a conveniently placed ladder, we estimated that the full tower would be constructed of four sections, all of similar size. As you can see this time, that is precisely what's happening. The main structure of these four tower segments has already been completed, and there seems to be no further indication of any additional tower segments to be built. So, as of now, it really looks like that this is it for the base structure of this brand new tower. There has also been a lot of progress in installing the hardware on these tower sections that will eventually support the crew. This includes simple stuff like stairs and handrails, but you can also see a lot of complex equipment like pressure pipes, heavy machinery, cable trays, basically all of the small things that make this all come together and work at the end of the day. On our last flyover, we suspected that the section here in the middle would be at the very top of the tower, the one that the crew will eventually use to enter the Crew Dragon capsule. After further analysis from our Mark I eyeballs, this is becoming more evident given the layout of the hardware and the floors. We can deduce that perhaps this floor here is like the one we see at LC-39A, where the crew arrives, they phone their loved ones, they march into the crew access arm, and then board their Dragon spacecraft. It's a bit unclear where the rocket will be in relation to this tower section, but Alex says here in the script, and it's his guess, not mine, is that we are likely looking at this side of the tower that will be facing the rocket and that the crew access arm would therefore be installed on the left. If this is the case, there's probably going to be a pad emergency egress system like at 39A on the other side of the tower. In case you don't know what this is, it's sort of like a zip line system that is used to quickly escape the tower in case of an emergency, like for example, a fire or some toxic spill. You definitely do not want to be sticking around in such a situation. We'll have to wait and see if they opt to build this system here at Roberts Road or whether they opt to build it elsewhere. But you bet that if we see it around here, we are definitely going to talk about it. As usual for the last few flyovers, there hasn't been a lot of progress or movement on the Starship hardware at Roberts Road, but we are patiently waiting to see when SpaceX comes back to it. Hopefully once they have dealt with all of the initial flights from Starbase. But if you want to know more about other big rockets, I believe Adrian might have something for us. Adrian? Indeed, Max. I have some great updates to talk through here about one of the other big rockets at the Cape, Blue Origins New Glen. The parking lots around Blue Exploration Park campus were overflowing as we flew over. And that's for a good reason. In the tank cleaning and testing facility, we spotted a New Glen first stage tank undergoing what appears to be a stress test. This would be similar to what we see when Starship tank sections are tested by the Camp Crusher at Starbase, more properly known as the Structural Test Stand. In this case, we see some ropes coming down from the top of the tank, which are rigged up to some pistons. These pistons will then pull down and adjust the amount of stress on the tank section. The markings on the side of this tank seem to be the same as the tank we saw inside of the TCAT back in May. So it's possible that this is the same tank continuing to work through a testing campaign, or maybe this is a new tank section in the same state as the one we saw back in May. Speaking of New Glenn hardware, 
Blue Origin recently published a new image of the manufacturing floor inside of the main factory here. And well, let's just say that this picture is very hardware rich. In this image we can see many barrel sections, domes, at least one engine section and of course what appears to be a new Glen first stage tank section. The catch? This photo was taken on the 14th of June. That is over two months ago. So we can only imagine how much progress Blue has made since then. Hopefully we will start seeing more of this hardware outside soon and then eventually at the launch site for testing. On that note, let's head down to Blue's pad, Launch Complex 36. Right away, we can see that there's some activity out on the launch pad. The Mini TE, which was previously saw testing a New Glenn second stage simulator, which we can now see by the hangar, was vertical on the pad with some lifts attending it. But wait, if the second stage simulator is down by the hangar, then what's being tested here? Our own Max Evans captured this shot of the structure on the pad before it went vertical. This circular structure with two cutouts in it seems to be resembling the bottom end of a new Glenn second stage where the two cutouts are for the BE-3U engines that will power the stage into orbit. This further leads to the idea that we may truly see Blue conduct test fires of new Glenn upper stages on the launch pad by using this mini TE. Just to the north, we can see that the Jarvis or Clipper test tank is still sitting on its new test stand. But not everything big at the Cape is just related to Blue Origin or SpaceX rockets. At the launch and landing facility, Amazon's big payload processing facility for their Kuiper satellite internet constellation continues to grow. The structure is now gaining a roof as the rest of the building continues to grow out over its footprint. Workers are also seen preparing the foundation for the western side of the building. There also appears to be at least one bridge crane already on site. There was a special guest at the LLF this week. NASA's iconic Super Guppy airplane was seen making a delivery to KSC. The container on the back of the truck looks a lot like what we have seen for Orion heat shields. So maybe it is for an Orion, who knows? After all, NASA has a few of them under construction at the Kennedy Space Center. Now, Sawyer, I think you might have more to say about flying. Uh, this is your uh, captain speaking. We know you have many airlines to choose from, uh, so we thank you for flying NSF Airlines, where every flight is technically a shuttle flight. Why should you fly with us? In fact, why should you fly with any airline? Isn't your flight likely to get delayed or canceled more with a certain airline? Well. You can figure that out for yourself with the help of today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant.org is continually adding new math, science, and computer-related lessons to their library of thousands of different topics, all of which make learning easy. I just finished a course about data probabilities, which helps you figure out which airline is actually the most reliable. It uses real-world data to help you interactively understand data sets and figure out the probability of getting delayed on different airlines. To get started with a 30-day free trial, visit Brilliant.org slash NASA Spaceflight or click the link in the description below. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Now, let's fly back into the video. In fact, flying over to SpaceX's launch pads at the Cape, it appears that the teams have moved the main parts of the LR11350 crane from Launch Complex 39A all the way over to Space Launch Complex 40. If you remember from the first part of the video, Max talked about the new tower sections for the crew access tower over at Pad 40. Well, this crane is the one that's going to be used to build it. This is not the first tower this crane has stacked for SpaceX though. It was previously used to stack the Starship launch tower over at 39A. We were hoping to see it still being used to install other stuff for the Starship launch pad, like say the ship quick disconnect umbilical arm or the orbital launch mount deck, but it seems like for now, that's on hold. Who knows? Maybe after the tower's done, it'll return to 39A and finish the job at the Starship pad. Hold on a second. Zoom in on that, please. Why am I asking if I'm the editor on this video? Anyway, there are still pieces of the crane needed for the crew tower at 39A. Well, that's where, guess what? Another crane comes in. You can see the smaller crane picking up pieces that will then be delivered over to pad 40. Once there, a totally different crane will help put the pieces together. This crane game seems more complicated than the ones over at the arcade. At 39A, 
you can see the Falcon 9 Transporter Erector, or TE, is in the horizontal position and has picked up the reaction fixture. That's where the hold downs and all of the umbilical connections for fueling the Falcon 9 are located. In this configuration, the TE is ready for rollback to the Horizontal Integration Facility, or HIF, to meet with its rocket. This mission is currently slated to fly before the end of the month and will carry a very diverse crew, including NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, ESA astronaut Andreas Mogesen, JAXA astronaut Satoshi Furukawa, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Konstantin Borisov. The four of them will spend six months aboard the ISS. Now, stay tuned for our live coverage of the launch, which will start around four hours prior to liftoff, right before the crew heads out to the launch pad. So what's better than one TE? Two TEs, ah, ah, ah. We can see the transporter erector horizontal back over at pad 40, right after the launch of Starlink Group 6-10, which launched the day before we flew over. In these shots, you can even see some venting from the liquid oxygen tank farm as trucks deliver the loxygen, as I like to call it, to help fill up Falcon 9 for its next flight, which as of now looks to be Starlink Group 6-11. Moving over to the port, the drone ship that'll likely catch the booster from that Starlink mission, just read the instructions, was being worked on. You can see the deck has been opened, probably to work on all of the equipment down below. We can also see the Octagrabber outside of its garage. That's what grabs onto the booster after landing to secure it for the trip back into the port. Maybe that's also getting worked on? We could also see ULA's rocket ship ship docked at the port. This one had come to the Cape to deliver the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS, for NASA's Artemis 3 mission. Remember, this is the mission that's set to land humans back on the moon for the first time since 1972. But that's not the only Artemis hardware being moved around the Cape in the last few days. Right, Jack? That's correct, Sawyer. Just the other day, we had rollout of NASA's Mobile Launcher 1 to launch Complex 39B, and our team in the sky happened to catch it right as it arrived. Mobile Launcher 1 supported the Artemis 1 mission in November of last year, and since then has been undergoing upgrades and refurbishment near the Vehicle Assembly Building at what's called the West Park site. We touched on some of these upgrades in other past flyovers, but in essence, these are mostly related to crewed missions, and that's because the next launch of NASA's SLS rocket will carry crew on board. Now, Artemis 2 is currently scheduled to fly no earlier than November of 2024, but this rollout is crucial to test the upgrades and crew rehearsals ahead of the next launch. Construction has also already begun on the mobile launcher that will be used for Artemis missions much further down the line, and that is Mobile Launcher 2. Mobile Launcher 2 will be used for the Block 1B version of SLS, which will be taller and more capable than the current Block 1 version. We can see in the flyover pictures how the first few big steel structures have already been put together, and a few cranes are now in place to begin assembling the platform. But regardless of how long it's going to take, it's still really cool to see all of the rocket hardware and support hardware being built at the Cape. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Be sure to get your 30-day free trial by going to brilliant.org slash NASA Spaceflight. And don't forget, if you're one of the first 200 people to use that link to sign up, you'll get 20% off your annual premium subscription. All right, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and don't forget, be excellent to each other.